this should be a, a very interesting uh, session. Uh, you know, we're just past the 15th anniversary of the start of Operation uh, Enduring Freedom. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, you will find what these gentlemen have to say uh, very, very uh, interesting. Uh, but first, for those of you I haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name is Dave Deptula. I'm the Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Power Studies. But more appropriately for this particular session, uh, back in uh, 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 fall of uh, 2001, um, I was a director of the Air Operations Center uh, that was responsible for putting together the initial uh, and then follow-on uh, attack plans uh, against the Al-Qaeda and uh, Taliban in response to the 9-11 uh, attacks. Just to put what these gentlemen did for you in perspective, uh, during Enduring Freedom, the B-2 flew a total of uh, six missions on the first three days of the war. Each sortie took a total of 70 hours. That includes the flight to Afghanistan, a turnaround at Diego Garcia for a new crew, and the flight back to uh, uh, Whiteman Air Force Base. Uh, and so we have some of the folks who actually flew those missions and their operations group commander at the time. And so what I'd like to do to put <clears throat> faces in context with what they did during the mission is um, I'd like to ask them to briefly introduce themselves and what they did at that time. Uh, and then I'll come back to you with a little bit of a stage setter and then we'll jump into questions. Go ahead, John. Um, Good afternoon. I'm Jonathan George. Uh, at the moment that uh, these individuals launched, I was the ops group commander of the 509th Bomb Wing. For those of you that aren't familiar with uh, the Air Force hierarchy, that's sort of like the war chief of the tribe, if you can look at it that way. And uh, it was my uh, third assignment uh, at Whiteman flying the B-2. I started in uh, 1993. Chad Stevenson, I was at the time mission planning cell, team chief, team lead, and then I flew number three. Good afternoon, Brian Neal. Back then I was a young captain with hair, and uh, I was uh, Mel's pilot for the night two's mission. Good afternoon, I'm Tony Syak. Um, at the time I was a major, and I was the uh, chief of weapons and tactics for one of the bomb squadrons involved. Uh, Mel Daly at the time, I still had no hair, um, but with, uh, I was a major and I was uh, the mission commander for night two with uh, Brian. Jim Dawkins, I was a major at the time. I worked for Chad in the mission planning cell and then flew on his wing during night three. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much, gentlemen. Now, to put the missions in context, I want to take you back for a minute uh, 15 years ago. Uh, on 9-11, I happened to be the director of the Air Force's Quadrennial Defense Review, and uh, I was at my desk around 9 o'clock uh, when my uh, deputy, uh, then Brigadier General Ron Bath, called me uh, from his car. He was on the way back from a medical appointment, and he said, hey, Dave, turn on the TV uh, and take a look. An airplane's uh, run into one of the World Trade Centers. And so I go, right, turn on the TV, and like all of you remember, it was a beautiful spring day. I thought, you know, maybe someone had a heart attack or something, and as I'm watching the, the, the TV, here comes the second airplane. I'm going, okay, this is, not a, this is not an accident. And then I remember thinking, you know what, the Pentagon could be a really good next target, literally. But what are you going to do about it? So I went back to my desk, uh, computer started working, uh, heard, <laughs> heard the sound of an airplane flying really low and hit the Pentagon. It was two quarters over. Uh, I won't go into all the details, bottom line is, you know, get up and leave. Uh, come back the next day, we were told to stay out of the building, but we came back the next day. That next day, second day, I get a call to come down to Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General John Jumper's office, who, cutting to the quick, said, hey, uh, Dave, um, we'd like you to go over and be the director of the Air Operations Center and do the planning for the response to Al-Qaeda attacks. What do you think? You know what the answer was. He said, okay, good. Don't screw up. He didn't say it exactly that way. Uh, head on down to Checkmate and uh, start doing some uh, planning for how we're going to respond. So 10 days later, I departed for the Combined Air Operations Center, which was located outside the town of Al-Kharj in Saudi Arabia, about two hours south of uh, Riyadh, uh, Prince Sultan uh, Air Base. And 15 days after that, 
on October 7, 2001, the first U.S. bombs fell on Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. The point is, it took less than 30 days from the 9-11 attacks to the response of a full-fledged air campaign on the other side of the world. If somebody had told me on the 10th of September that in less than 30 days, I'd be in the Mideast planning B-2s to attack the Taliban in Afghanistan, I would have thought they were nuts. Uh, and I think all of you would have uh, too. Now we selected the B-2 as a key element of the opening attacks for a number of reasons. One, it's responsiveness. It could get to Afghanistan directly in a matter of hours without being forward deployed. Two, it had a large payload. It carried 16 2,000 pound JDAMs, all weather precision weapons, with a big punch. And during the course of their attacks, the B-2 dropped the satellite-aided GBU-37 5,000 pound earth penetrator weapons for the first time in combat on deeply buried leadership targets. And three, its penetrating capability, uh, due to its low observability or stealth, was one of the key reasons why we used the platform. Because even though the, the Taliban in Afghanistan didn't have a first-rate air defense system, they did have an air defense system. We didn't know how integrated it was. You know, they had uh, a bunch of airplanes, uh, mainly the leftover uh, Soviet uh, uh, fighters. Um, but the B-2 was used in locations where there was significant radar coverage and there was the potential of uh, uh, a significant air defense threat. Now, most of the 31 targets struck during the first night, which featured around 275 individual weapon aim points, were in the categories of, of air defense uh, and leadership facilities. Obviously, what we wanted to do was secure the airspace so we could then continue to prosecute uh, attacks, which we did, and changed the nature of what the Northern Alliance had been trying to do the previous uh, five years. By the third day, we'd achieved that goal of securing control of the airspace over all of Afghanistan, from which we proceeded to unseat the Taliban regime and destroy the Al-Qaeda terrorist training camps. So with that brief stage setter, let's now turn to the panel and hear from those who actually planned the specific and individual missions and flew them. Uh, and what I'm going to do is orchestrate this to make sure that we have plenty of time for you to ask questions and interact with the folks. <coughs> My first question is going to go to General George. As the B-2 Wing Operations Group Commander at the time, what were your major concerns surrounding these very, very long missions? Um, if you'll humor me just for a second, uh, I'll try to quickly get to that uh, response, but I think maybe in this form it's uh, insightful to realize that uh, this, this is bigger than just talking about a single weapon system. Um, and the reason I point that out, you didn't mention it, but uh, General Jumper, I think his very first full day on the job was September 11th. So the, the drive to be prepared for what you aren't prepared for has got to be instrumental in who we are as a team and as a people. And uh, I don't think we've got a better air power advocate, even affectionately zealot, than General Deptula in our country. Um, but it, it's more than just 30 days, the mechanics that he was mentioning, and if I can uh, go back real quickly. In 1996, I had the opportunity as a younger officer, squadron commander, to be in Singapore for the first uh, international air show that the B-2 performed in. On the ground, uh, Lynn Linton and I were going to fly the jet out of Singapore after General Marcotte and uh, Steve Sicking brought it in. And uh, as most of you have been to air shows, it's a, a lot of uh, commotion and activity. When the B-2 came over the horizon to line up on final, every single person, and these were all international individuals, every single person dropped what they were doing. And there was an F-18 that was uh, in the middle of its routine, turned and looked at the B-2. And I think that was kind of a salient moment to realize that people outside of our domain 
constantly judge who we are as Americans. And when you see something for the first time like a B2, even if it never did anything kinetic, it causes friends, allies, adversaries, and enemy to think twice about what it must be to be an American. Okay, so that was 1996. Uh, I'll, I'll brag on some of these individuals. When I went to Whiteman for my third assignment in May of 2000, the very first week that I was there, Captain Stevenson walked into the office and he said, um, we're tracking this individual called Osama bin Laden. Don't know what he's doing, but he's up to something that looks like it would be suspicious. So I, on that first week as the ops group commander, I walked back into a team that was thinking proactively ahead about what do we do about it, a small group of 2,000 people in uh, west central Missouri. Uh, Jules, Julian Tolbert, came to me um, oh, about two months later, already thinking about how is the B-2 going to get to targets all over the world because terrorism is certainly on the menu of today and we don't know where it's going to emanate from and where we're going to have to respond. And uh, I'm a crusty colonel at the time, set in my ways. These younger officers were plotting routes that I would never in my right mind have think that would I fly over the Soviet Union. Obviously in 2001 it wasn't the Soviet Union. But, but these officers were thinking creatively about how do we apply air power where our country might need it. Um, Bruce, uh, Bruce Schmidt and Harry Foster said, these missions are gonna take longer than just the 36 hours it takes to get to any one point on the planet. We don't even know if the, if the jet's got the fortitude to stay running for that long. So we would fly an aircraft up to 100 hours. Obviously, you can't do that all in one, maybe in one mission. We'd fly a jet for a long sortie, put it on the ground, wouldn't shut down the motors, uh, fly it again, and leave it running for up to 100 hours to find out what are going to be the limitations. Is the oil consumption going to cause the the uh, need to shut down, and how do we plan for where that shutdown might be to be so that we can refuel the jet, replenish the oil, things like that. Um, the, uh, probably the, the most interesting aspect, Jeff Long came with uh, uh, Beaner, Rob O'Neill, and said, well, we know we can fly 24 hours. We know we can fly 36 hours. OAF had done that for us. But what if we have to fly for 50, 60 hours? So these individuals, on their own, started going to the simulator and flying sorties that were 50 up to 72 hours nonstop. Now, we had an excellent high-fidelity simulator that you could do this sort of thing. But I guess the, the bottom line was that... Uh, I know American technology engineering, the STEM community is going to give us great hardware if the requirements are, are enunciated in a fashion that you can rise to the occasion. But to a large extent, we've also got a human capital part of this equation that we cannot let slip away. And when you're starting to talk about 20 B2s, the force of that, you don't have a lot of human capital. Uh, if it's 100 bombers, that's still not a lot of human capital that is a huge part of this solution. And uh, uh, I was lucky that I stumbled into a group of uh, heroes here. Uh, the question that was kind of given to me maybe to think about was, you know, what did you worry about? Uh, truly, truly, I, I uh, watched in admiration as every one of these individuals, men, but at the time, we already had our first two uh, female aviators in the pipeline for training. So this is not a, a gender uh, insult. Uh, uh, they just weren't trained up, ready to go into combat yet. But I watched in admiration as, as every one of these individuals walked to the jet with complete confidence that they were easily going to rise to the occasion. So I, I was probably the, uh, probably the, the calmest and uh, most uh, confident, secure individual out of the whole, whole team.
because there, there were some frustrations that, at the end of the day, they're the ones that had to make things uh, come together and put bombs on target. Very good. Thanks very much, General George. Our second question goes to Colonel Chad uh, Stevenson. Chad, what did planning require for this uh, long-range strike mission, and what were some of the, the, the key and unique aspects that were uh, uh, unique to the long-range strike mission? So unique aspects of the mission were, again, just the duration. But I would go back to it's all about training. We had already, through uh, spirit flags, red flags, uh, what we called spirit hawks at the time to practice LO, uh, exercise formerly known as spirit hawks that we would do at night at 2 to 3 o'clock in the morning over top of Nellis. That helped us train. We built those mission plans and simulated targets that could possibly hit uh, across the, the world. Uh, and so there was nothing unique in the mission planning other than uh, the fact that we were actually going to uh, get to go do it for ourselves and for a lot of folks their first time in combat. The interesting aspects always came down uh, Mr. Mark Altabelli is in the audience here. He was the map chief at CENTAF at the time. And having you might explain map is master attack attacking. planning. <clears throat> yep, yep. So he was in charge of all the targets and so when he and I became intimately familiar uh, over probably a year prior up to that point, and then during that point, I probably talked to him more than I did my wife uh, during that time. And um, coming up with what we called the tanker bill. Chad, what is the tanker bill? What is the routing that is most desirable? Uh, what is the quickest route? Where could we plank tank? Could, could we put tankers? And how could we make that all happen? And we came up with routes that went west. We came up with routes that went east. And we came out with routes that went over the pole north and south. And they all had their different pluses and minuses, uh, but it really came down to is where could we get the tankers into in a short amount of time. And uh, the work that AMC did and the work that uh, CENTAF did to get those assets in place was amazing. Um, the, the routing uh, within country was pretty much well determined by the targets and again and by the threat systems in there. They weren't uh, anything unique that we hadn't already planned for, uh, we had seen before. Um, one of the unique aspects to it was about seven to ten days prior, uh, uh, Colonel Major Altobelli at the time asked me, could you actually fly out of Diego Garcia and plan to fly missions out of there? And it kind of caught me off guard because we had just planned on flying the stories to turn around and bring him back and then bringing the team back. And he basically said, uh, that, that may be an option, could you do that? So the answer was yes, but we had to change our lineup at that point. We had to change the lineup from it, the very experienced guys um, to guys that were trained in the MPC mission planning cell process at the wing. And that caused, a, as you could imagine, a great perturbation, not only with the guys that are flying, uh, but with the guys that were doing the mission planning cell and trying to figure out where they're going to go and where they're coming back and where you sat and ranked in that order of, are you going to fly a combat mission? Are you going to return or not? and what night would you fly? And so that was kind of an interesting conversation and scenario that went on there at one point. Uh, uh, if there was a, a point where there was a lot of guys uh, uh, upset with each other, that would be the point. And uh, if they were upset with anyone, it was at me because I was trying to pick the guys that I knew that I could operate with, with about six folks in a very small setting for hours at a time. And just like flying a plane for hours at a time, uh, that's a unique environment in a mission planning cell, trying to get things accomplished. Um, the last thing that was unique about this was the, the use of Combat Track 2 and making sure all the folks were trained with that uh, piece of equipment. Uh, during Kosovo, we had done route changes and target changes over a small digital entry panel and using base words and code words, and guys had to have a keyboard or sheet of paper and doing the math in public and doing everything to make sure it worked <clears throat> wasn't ideal. And so uh, the summer of 2000, Air Force Tank Cap, uh, Technical Exploitation for National Capabilities came and visited us and they had this track too that they had used with AMC with the Special Ops guys. And we found a way, thanks to <laughs> General George and uh, the Wing Commander, to put it on the platform and literally start training guys about six months prior. And, and that made a, a large difference, as I think some of the guys will attest to, because by the time guys took off on night two, 
The targets had changed on what was available. They were making wholesale changes, and by the time we flew on night three, we took off with night two's targets, expecting General Dogs and I to get, get wholesale changes, and we did. And uh, that was the, the input to where understanding how important communications was with a current ATO process and with the current uh, battlefield dynamics going on. That, again, is kind of unique to the long range strike, that you're able to do that and have that capability in a real time manner is very important. Thanks, Chad. Uh, just a, a short anecdote on the combat track to uh, General Wald, who is a Joint Force Air Component Commander, and I uh, uh, very much valued having the ability to direct changes or inform the <coughs> changes because of the amount of time that they were on. Uh, transiting en route. So this was great to be able to talk right from the Combined Air Operations Center to the, to the bomber. We also thought we were doing, doing them a good favor by trying to keep them awake. So like every two hours we'd send a message. Well, unbeknownst to us, um, I, get, I mean you guys can verify this. This is the first time in 15 years we've ever talked face to face on this, but you know, evidently a, a loud alarm or buzzer would go off and those that, that crew member that's trying to get a little bit of sleep, what we were doing is interrupting their sleep cycle instead of helping them out. So, anyway. All right, we're going to turn now to Colonel Brian and Neil. Uh, uh, Brian, what did it take to prep for a 40 hour mission? Uh, you know, what were those aspects that the crews were surprised by, uh, and what should we inform the youngsters in this audience who are going to be long range strike drivers in the future, uh, what they need to be aware of and think about when they're prepping for a mission? Just like any championship team, most of the heavy lifting occurs in the off-season and the preseason, and certainly that was the foundation of our preparation uh, in the Air Force. We have four pillars uh, for comprehensive airman fitness to include physical, which was a huge factor in being uh, confined to a small closet for two days, and uh, also the, so the social, uh, the mental and spiritual aspects. And the Air Force does a great job of training our airmen in, in those foundational principles to ensure that they're ready on uh, any notice. And then, as these gentlemen have alluded to prior, uh, we did a tremendous amount of, of simulations, uh, and so those assets were critical in our preparation. And then immediately in the three weeks uh, before the mission, there was some intense uh, study downstairs in the vault uh, with Colonel Stevenson and his cadre. Uh, across the base, uh, the team united to work overtime and all the time to prepare for uh, the unexpected, and they did a superb job in providing us uh, both mission planning products, uh, the, the jet, uh, the maintainers, uh, what they provided, uh, all the support that we received from uh, other outside agencies, uh, absolutely critical in the preparation process in order for us to uh, be so fortunate as to represent them when it came time to uh, execute that mission. There were several uh, surprising things, I would have to say, although uh, we shouldn't have been surprised. We know that no plan survives first contact with the enemy, and uh, the second law of thermodynamics says all things tend towards disorder. Uh, so I, I was surprised how calm General George was. Uh, I was surprised they let me fly. Um, I was surprised, uh, uh, as uh, Colonel Stevenson mentioned, about the dynamic nature of the mission, how it changed hour by hour. Uh, I was surprised that General Deptula kept waking me up. Uh, uh, the human factors involved, you know, you don't, you don't have a lot of opportunities to, to practice um, being in a closet for 48 hours. And so when you're under a, a decent amount of stress and you've, you've been at it for a while and, and you don't have the sleep cycles that you're used to. Um, another funny example, uh, surprising, came to mind when uh, my mission commander here, Dr. Daly, smart guy, PhD, uh, told me that our, our weapon needed an in-flight alignment and he asked me if I could uh, turn 30 degrees to the right and as a good pilot, I did what my mission commander told me to do. But he rolled his eyes and said, or the left. And I said, 
uh, no, Mel, we're turning to the right. Oh, yeah, 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 we're turning to the right. We're turning to the right. So I was a little surprised <laughs> that a PhD had a little trouble with left and right. Uh, <laughs> but I attribute that really to human factors and a long time in the closet with me and not anything else. Um, it, was, uh, it was a dynamic environment, but the support and the preparation that the entire team there at Whiteman gave us uh, allowed us to overcome all of those things. Uh, uh, the best surprise actually had to do with Tony. Uh, they had pre-positioned our, our food and supplies in the airplanes for us, and it was a great surprise for me, bad for Tony, that uh, his sandwich materials and fresh cantaloupe ended up in my aircraft and not his. So thanks again for that, Tony. <laughs> what, should the, <laughs> what should the future uh, LRS uh, strike pilots expect? They should expect the unexpected, and they should use that to fuel their motivation uh, to continue to prepare and train for what lies ahead that, uh, that we do not know, and for the Air Force as a whole and for us as a people to maintain that posture of readiness like General Joy's alluded to, uh, to do whatever we can, the best we can uh, now, not knowing what tomorrow holds. Very good. Just a real quick note to put things in context again. Um, this occurred yeah, Operation Enduring Freedom occurred 10 years after Desert Storm. In Desert Storm, uh, probably on the order of 98% of the aircraft took off knowing exactly where they were going to deliver their ordnance. 10 years later, that situation, uh, maybe not completely reversed, but pretty close. Uh, the vast majority of aircraft, when they took off, didn't know where they were going to place their ordnance. And you know, we invented this thing called the time-sensitive targeting cycle. Uh, and what, what caused this dramatic change? Well, I, I would tell you there are advances in modern telecommunications. The ability to communicate rapidly, to be able to sense information, rapidly turn that to the planners, who could then determine and relay the new situational awareness to the crews who could then do something about it. So most of the time, uh, after those initial three days, uh, we launched aircraft not knowing exactly where they were going to hit. Uh, and that's what kind of became the birth of dynamic targeting. Okay, we're going to turn now to Kearney, uh, uh, Colonel uh, uh, Tony uh, Chiak. And uh, Tony, I'd ask you to outline a bit how and why certain targets were selected for the mission, as well as what success would mean uh, in accomplishing hitting those targets for the rest of the operation during freedom. Absolutely, General. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, it, um, not only did I, 15 years ago, did I fly one mile behind uh, Jethro, but now I'm talking after him, which is always a challenge. Um, so, because uh, I love listening to, listening to your stories and, and, and your points. They're an awesome job. Um, you know, General, you, you highlighted why we were selected, and it was its responsiveness, it's the payload, and it's the ability to penetrate enemy defenses, which really kind of outlines how our targets were kind of selected, and I'd really like to, I mean, Alto knows exactly because he was in the map cell there who was actually developing the master air attack plan. What was interesting is, is, is as General George has highlighted um, already, um, the training that we endured as, if you will, B-2 line pilots um, prepared us for this mission. Um, and so, uh, although General George thinks he had the easiest or the less stressful job, honestly, we were ready. And, and we were ready because of that visionary leadership that prepared us for um, sitting in an airplane for 40 plus hours um, looking at the airplane that your lunch is in. Um, and so um, <laughs> I am living proof, by the way, that, I could, that a human being can live on a 12 by 12 Ziploc bag full of chocolate chip cookies that his wife and his daughter <laughs> Um General, you outlined it right up front. Honestly, what were the targets? They, they, the job of the B-2 of, and, and let's, I like, I like General George's point is, is this isn't about the B-2. This isn't about necessarily a weapon. So this is about concept. This is about being airmen and what we do in defense of our nation. And that is, is we engage 
an enemy's air defenses. And as a stealth platform, it's our job. It was our job, night one, uh, night two, uh, and night three in particular, to, to, uh, to use the phrase, kick the door down. That was our job, was to kick the door down, to, to, to neutralize or destroy the enemy air defenses so that the rest of our forces would achieve in, in Afghanistan's case, perhaps not just air superiority, but quite honestly, air dominance. Um, and that's what we did. Um, night one went through and we knocked, we, we, uh, the, the limited surface to air missiles that were in the country were targeted. Um, and the B-2 at that time was the only platform that had the, as you put, the responsiveness, the payload, the penetration capability to do that. Um, um, and um, additionally, night two, you know, General, we, we took off and um, our, our blue line when we took off on night two, by the way, I took off on night two, um, right behind my lead here. Um, night one had not happened yet. We, we took off and the war had not, if you will, started yet. And we were launching for the second night of conflict. Um, our, our flight, our path from the, from the crew's perspective ended at the border um, because um, we had that piece of, well, we've got to figure out, you know, what's next on what, how effective was night one, how, uh, what kind of restrike requirements are there. Uh, and so we were on cap every two hours. We'd get the wake-up call going, okay, what's our next, where are we, what's our targets? And so uh, as we're uh, making our way, I think it was about six hours or so before we actually penetrated the airspace, we got our targets. Um, and then um, um, I know how busy you were because uh, Dan, the guy, our mission, my mission commander, um, we estimated around 10,000 keystrokes is what was required for him to be able to finish the, the line, to finish the mapping, to finish the targeting if you will, in that amount of time. Incredibly busy, which comes back to the idea of combat track two. And, and again, beyond the idea of a B2, of a specific weapon system or a specific communications capability, we have to be, we have those visionary, that visionary leadership looking out what's next. And so um, uh, what type of communications are gonna be required? What's going to be uh, needed to support the war fighter. Um, and, and honestly, at the end of the day, um, we uh, took down all of their surface-to-air missiles, we destroyed all of their MiGs, and we uh, damaged the, their ability to launch aircraft in a way that allowed us to then come in and use those airfields. Okay, that's the, that's the very unique precision targeting capability that the B-2 and the B-2 only had back then was to be able to take down those three elements and still leave us uh, the ability to then move in and begin our operations as a nation. General, thank you for the question. Very good, Tony. Mel, could you uh, kind of expand on what Tony had to say from your perspective and describe unique attributes of long-range strike, uh, particularly kind of that uh, unique flexibility that was afforded to the whole mission set through the use of the B-2? So I think, you know, when we look at, we've already talked about before, right? So when we look at the B-2 or we look at just bombers in general for the Air Force, which the Air Force was, uh, bombers have been a part of Air Force history since its foundation, that we've always had a bomber as a central point of the Air Force. And so uh, the, route, the two primary reasons for that were range and payload. Billy Mitchell said, as air covers the earth, aircraft can go anywhere. Yes, if we have enough air refueling is... As Chad talked about, as long as you have a tanker you know, bridge, you can go anywhere you want to. So this is why we flew halfway across the earth and back. And so this is, that's one aspect. The other is payload. Um, we had 16 JDAMs each. Um, the difference is uh, the precision capability and the ability of bombers to produce mass effect. So one of the things was, um, as a second, young second lieutenant uh, flying missions in the Gulf War in 1991, it was three B-52s per target, 45 weapons each, et cetera. That, that changes in OAF. OAF is a, is a threshold conflict because 
it's going to be the first time in our history that we're going to move to per predominantly precision weapons. And OAF is, uh, we're going to use pre predominantly all, of, everybody's going to be dropping precision, or most people will be dropping precision at OAF. So we now are in uh, OEF. OAF is the first time the B2 uses them, and OEF, everybody's got JDAMs by now. And so now we're, instead of talking about planes per target, now we're talking about targets per plane. And I think that's the, the difference that the B2s make that night um, is one aspect. And uh, for Brian and I, whether, you know, 44.3 being the longest mission is, you know, a blessing or a curse, that's where we, we were, or as we like to say, 70 plus piddle packs later, that's how we measured the real, <laughs> the real effect of the mission. But, um, but the idea was is that we serviced four targets, we came out of country, and the flexibility is the other aspect of, of that mission or of the B-2 and of bombers in general that they bring to the fight. Uh, we, ended, we exited the country, we still had JDAMs retained um, from the mission, and we were tasked to go find a tanker and go back in and, and go back and service another target, which is, again, the flexibility aspect of it. 70% of the targets changed from the moment we took off till we got into country 30 plus hours later. And then to come back out and to go back in um, was another aspect of, of the flexibility of the B-2, that we could exit the country, top off with gas, and then go back in and service another target. So five target areas in one mission, uh, I think, is the, and the last thing I'll add is we've talked about the penetrating, but just the stealth aspect, that this is, you know, this was an aircraft, is an aircraft that has a penetration capability that is like no other. So we can exit the country, get gas, go back in, and then uh, we can do it without worrying about escort, et cetera, because we are low observable, but it also requires some human ingenuity and tactics to get a stealth platform uh, to the target. And I think those are the things that just make the B-2 and that mission unique uh, from the standpoint of what we did that night. Very good. Thanks very much, Joe. Uh, Joe Dawkins, how about uh, wrapping this up by providing us with your perspective on why the capabilities that we've heard uh, talked about are essential to maintain uh, in our future force structure through the uh, acquisition of the B-21? Well, um, to me it's pretty simple. It can be wrapped up in uh, just a few words. Um, it provides the president options across the spectrum of conflict to execute uh, our nation's business. So um, because the president does not have to worry about checking with another country to base out of there, or in some cases fly over their territory, he can uh, pick up the phone and call uh, the Pentagon and say, I want to go um, send an effect, whatever that effect may be, to any point uh, on the uh, globe. And he can do that, like I said, across the spectrum of conflict, whether it's um, uh, low intensity conflict, you know, as bombers have done supporting um, troops on the ground, uh, all the way to uh, the conventional conflict like we talked about here, and then at the high end of the scale, um, if need be, uh, uh, using a nuclear deterrent. Um, so to allow folks to have a little bit more time to ask questions, I'll just stop there because these guys took all my good comments. <laughs> <laughs> Smart man, you can see why he's a general officer. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. We, uh, we, we wrapped up. I wanted to have 20 minutes for Q&A. So what we'll do now is open this up to the floor for Q&A. Please identify yourself. Uh, and then um, uh, you can either direct your question to one of the panel members here, or I can help you direct. So questions? Jim. Jim Widocci, uh, when you got into Afghanistan, what were the limiting factors as to when you had to actually leave? Was it was you, because you expended all your bombs? Or what were the limiting factors that, that made you leave before you expended all your bombs? In our case, we had we had satisfied all of the given target sets that that we were tasked with at that point. So we still also had retained weapons as well. Um, but we had we had been that was we had, that was the extent of the target sets we had been given. It's nice to have that luxury. That's the thing that it is. I was a little frustrated because Alto did not uh, come up with any more targets, and Chad and I had to take a couple of weapons back with us even after we had a tanker. And uh, we're ready to go back in country. Um. I'm I'm going to jump in there on that too. And obviously, I did not fly uh, these courageous missions. But one thing 
that we need to be a little cautious of. And uh, I spent a year on the ground in Afghanistan, so I know the, the terrain from six feet tall. I have great admiration for what's going on in Afghanistan. I've got great admiration for the people of Afghanistan. But I will be the first one to tell you that it, it is not a typically worthy society that would require continuous B-2 presence to hold targets at risk. And my concern is it's easy for us to have great hindsight and look at what was necessary in order to beat previous foes. But these individuals, as much as they were successful in Afghanistan, they constantly think about a more sophisticated potential adversary, which the B-2 in 2001 was also well suited to confronting, not 13th century warlords running around a austere uh, countryside. So I've got to be careful not to make assumptions based off of a foe that is not very sophisticated with capability that they bring to the fight that is maybe can't quite talk about it in public, but that they've got to be ready to confront. So uh, I, I'm not sure we want to compare too many apples and oranges with what they were, where they were, and what their limitations might have been with a society that, that might not be overly challenging. Yeah, gentlemen, uh, James Drew from Aviation Week. Uh, there's um, there's a, a pathway toward the B-2 being armed with the future long-range standoff weapon, um, which will really introduce a standoff capability uh, that, that it doesn't currently have unless there's something you guys know that we don't. Um, and so do you see that as being a, an important development for the B-2 to keep it flying into the future? Um, and also, uh, since you guys have dropped a penetrating bomb, uh, what, what do you think about the normalization of massive ordnance penetrator within Air Force Global Strike Command delivered by the V2s? Just throw those bombs out. <laughs> uh, to your first question, so there is a um, cruise missile capability, if you will, off the B2 now. It's uh, conventionally based. And I think your question was based on a nuclear armed cruise missile, is that correct? Uh, yes. So, um, uh, you know, that's, again, a future uh, capability that they're looking at and uh, making the decisions on those now. As they press ahead, uh, they'll look to integrate that across the range of bomber platforms. Um, now, your second question, uh, could you repeat that for the... Uh, the, the normalization of the massive ordnance penetrator, uh, that was a bomb that was developed for very specific targets. Um, but now it's a standard part of the inventory after going through various development cycles. And so is that an important capability that America needs to retain? I think that goes back to um, my statement on the uh, my initial statement about it providing the president options to go against uh, hard and deeply buried targets. Um, that was a fantastic capability again, or, or is a fanta uh, fantastic capability uh, to be able to uh, take something that big and make it hit a, uh, a very small spot on the ground. Again, it, it just adds to the, to the president's capabilities or his, um, his options to hold targets at risk across the globe. Uh, Colin Clark, Breaking Defense. As, as you guys were moving in, you, you keep mentioning the uh, updating and the targeting. Uh, how much uh, did you actually get new targets once you headed off and were up in the air. Uh, so for Brian and I, it was 70%. So 70% of the targets changed from the moment uh, we took off until we entered country. Um, we really, I mean, without giving away any stuff, we, we really don't talk once we enter country. Let's just put it that way. Um, and then when we came out, we got uh, a new target set, and that's why we went back in. And I would assume that this is now st SOP, yes? The, the, tar the targets get changed yes. during yeah. missions in, I would assume, near real time now. Yep, young man in the middle.
Well, you just can't, yeah, just speak up. So the V2 bomber has been raised in kind of a risk area. What does it look like in the future that the V2 bomber needs to possibly not be in the risk area? Good question. I think. I mean, Tony kind of hit on this, right? The, the primary mission of the first three nights was to gain and maintain air superiority. And in my opinion, that will always be the number one mission of the Air Force, is the first thing has to be to gain and maintain air superiority. Uh, we were lucky enough, or I shouldn't say fortunate enough, that uh, we had six aircraft that could do the mission. Uh, going forward with the proliferation of triple-digit SAMs, you're not going to need, you're going to need more than a niche force of stealth bombers to do that mission. Yeah, I'm going to jump in here too because it goes back to what uh, Jump George had mentioned at the very beginning when he was talking about personnel, which can all be summarized in the idea of the necessity of having robust force structure. 20 B2s, that's it? And then if you look at what's available for actual, uh, their, their actual tasking, it's a fraction of that 20. It can vary on any one day, but it's less than 10. So if you look at the spectrum of threats around the world, and, 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 and you, you heard it with, with uh, Colonel uh, uh, Stevenson talking about, the, okay, yeah, we could have uh, deployed to Diego Garcia, but his concern wasn't numbers, although it really was numbers, it was numbers of personnel. So when we get to talking about force structure, you know, this nation has to make a determination that decision makers who are making decisions on future force structure need to think not just in terms of dollars, but in terms of why you have this force in the first place. And that's to defend the nation. So force structure needs to be directly tied to our national security structure, not some arbitrary budget limit. And, you know, we're, we, we talk now that you know, we're looking at uh, a nominal 100 as a minimum for the B-21, uh, which is about half what we really need if you look at the national security strategy. Yes, ma'am. So, Rachel, let's give us some energy analysis on this. Um, given Jump George's comments, you know, what are the challenges for the Air Force right now, leadership in the Pentagon, leadership in Congress, looking at modernization, force structure, readiness. I'd be interested in your opinions on where you see the biggest challenges and the need for us to flex to meet those challenges, how we should respond to it. Across those priorities, if you're going to get specific readiness, you can talk about whether you're talking about banning, training, or equipping. Um, that would be good to hear. <laughs> Go ahead, Jonathan, jump in. There. <laughs> um, so uh, let's take this in piecemeal real quickly. The, the foundation of national security uh, is twofold. The commander in chief's got two tools that he can use better than anybody else. The first one is he's got the biggest checkbook. So if he needs to negotiate, it requires a monetary investment, regardless of who he's talking to. Uh, he can write the check or he can withhold the check. So our economy is, is critical. The other one, other building block that all of this rests on is deterrence. It gives us freedom of action for every single thing that we do, whether it's in the boardroom or it's out on the battlefield. So we've got to take care of those two things first. And then, because of the enabling effect of those two, then we can start worrying about whether we're going to have a dust up in southwest Oklahoma or we're going to have a, a huge battlefield fight in northern Indiana, wherever it is. I'm using places that shouldn't be provocative because I don't want to be quoted starting a fight with someone outside the United States. So, and, and I know you well enough, Rachel, that you're, you're extremely smart. I, I don't think anybody does a very good job of predicting the future as to what do we really need to invest in because the 20 that we got was because everybody thought the Cold War's over so we don't need to invest in B2s. The mission has gone away. So instead of 132 or whatever it was going to be, just buy 20 of them. And we'll use them as museum pieces as the days go on. And because of creativity and leadership across uh, both the legislature and the executive branches, 
they were able to morph into more than just being nuclear deterrents. So uh, I would like to meet the individual that's got a brilliance in being able to predict the future, but I would say take care of the checkbook and deterrence first, and then we can, we can migrate to the other things that are going to be out there. Obviously, there are nation states that uh, have growing, we should have growing interest in. Uh, terrorism seems to be just like it was on the plains of uh, Texas in the 1860s. Terrorism is going to continue on. Uh, there are a number of things that we've got to be able to address, but it starts with those two building blocks right there. That makes sense. I'll add that you know we're a victim of our own success. Um, we, I had spent some time up at Minot Air Force Base flying the B-52 and uh, able to maintain a 75 to 80 percent mission capable rate on a 50-year-old airplane is uh, truly impressive, um, largely due to our maintainers, but also the, the, the uh, folks that built that airplane and the folks that, uh, that take a, a hard scrub, take a hard look at it uh, when it goes into uh, uh, heavy maintenance um, at the depot level, as we like to call it, just to get an overhaul, if you will. Um, same thing with the B-2. If, uh, again, um, we've built some, you know, back in that, well, let me go back. Back in World War II, we were building fighters and bombers very quickly, and we didn't like that design. we just do something else. Um, we've gotten, again, so, so good at building uh, aircraft and uh, ships and other things that uh, we don't have to replace them very often. And the problem with that is uh, sometimes we get to where we have all the bills coming due at once. To replace some of these systems, and that's just a challenge. That, uh, getting back to General uh, George's point, that uh, the nation has to face up to and decide how it's going to go forward. Thanks. Yes, sir. I'm going to step out of there and say man version, just because for. For two factors. One, um, if, if it's, I don't have to worry about this because I'm in civilian clothes. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to say this. Um, one, do you want to put a $700 million aircraft in the hands of nobody who's up there? Uh, so it's a B-2, uh, despite the fact I had to fly with Brian for 40 hours. But uh, it's nice to have both of us up there so that if something goes wrong, there are two people there to handle the machine. To, if any of you want to fly home and get on an aircraft that has no pilots, have at it. But you want somebody up there in that cockpit if something, you want a Captain Sully, right? If something goes wrong, you want someone who's going to save that aircraft. So uh, I think one, that's the other, one is you, you want a man bomber for that reason. Um, you also want a man bomber because it's dual capable and it's going to be nuclear and you want two people up there to make sure that if it's supposed to do it, it's supposed to, and if it's not, it's not. Uh, and then the third reason is because um, you want someone, if it needed to be, to put eyes on target. Uh, some of the missions we didn't have to put eyes on target, some of the missions we did. And I think those are reasons why I think the next bomber should be manned. Susan Loricchio, AFA Air Power Advocate, New York. Uh, something current today with Russia completing the installation of the air defense around Syria. What are your concerns about us trying to get aircraft in there to bomb uh, the government installations or, or targets there, with Russia being so sophisticated and, like you mentioned, not, not you know, primitive? You can call it Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> It's not layered, yeah. is what I would say. It, it, you know, it's a we, um, and again, I'm retired, so, but that. I just go back and I, and I'll look at American ingenuity. I mean, if I want to boil it down to that, but honestly, when I was working at Whiteman and I worked with these men and women of the 509th, we were faced, quite honestly, now, it's a different time, it's a different, it's a different, if you will, mission set. But we were told things that it's impossible to do. And you know what? We did it anyways. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna fall back on 
you know, I'm not in the class, I'm not in the, I'm not in this mission set world today, or I don't have any idea what they're dealing with right now over there. But I can tell you, we got some really, really smart folks working on that. And I, and I trust that. Uh, that's, that would be my response. Let me real quickly uh, the, the, uh, take the politics out of the situation in the context of, uh, look, there are advanced surface air missile systems that are going to be deployed around the world. Well, many of us have been saying this for 25, 30 years. That's why you need to keep up with technologies to be able to deal with those kinds of systems. Um, you know, and that's why we need uh, low observable systems that uh, just not about uh, dealing with acquisition systems, but working throughout the entire kill chain. And systems like F-22, F-35, B-21 um, will be able to operate in conjunction with one another to deal with any threat that's out there. Yes, sir. Steve Traver from Congressman Pierce's office. I want to follow up on the uh, question about actually human factors. Um, we've recently had a discussion actually in this room about uh, is there an emerging requirement for a uh, two-person F-35? I mean, <clears throat> coming to realize that no matter how much information we tell one guy, some of these war games that we're anticipating uh, the F-35 being a key part of, we're just going to overload one guy unless you know we really start with electrodes in his head. You know, is is there a is there a two-person F-35 out there in the future? Hearing your stories makes me think about a uh, uh, discussion in an entirely different war game about are we going to need a three-person long-range strike bomber? Because both in the conventional scenarios, but in some of the nuclear deterrent scenarios, the plan is going to be for you guys to be flying 24 and 36 hour missions with a lot to do. Um, and so I'd be interested in your opinion just on, on your experiences. You know, could you have used a third guy productively in the cockpit of some of this? Thank you. In less than a minute. Yeah, in less than a minute. <laughs> The, the, the last question is, no, uh, two, two individuals was absolutely what was necessary in this situation. We were in country, we were wide awake, trust me, we were wide awake. So, you know, and we'd flown, we'd flown, again, coming back to the training that we were put through in preparation for these missions, we were already flying 24-hour continuous flights around the United States. We, we'd already done that. So 24 hours, that's only two lunches, you know? So. I think uh, some, some people may not know that the B-2 actually had a, a design for a third person uh, to go into the aircraft. There was, a, there was an ejection seat uh, capable for the third person to go in there and it was decided not to. I think the human factor said it was something like it take 2.1 or 2.2 people to fly the aircraft, so they decided to eliminate the third person. Um, uh, third person would just mean less food and less drinks for the rest of us. So. Well, it's an interesting question. We're going to wrap it up. I mean, I think that one of the one of the things that we need to look towards. I mean, this has been an item of discussion for many, many years in terms of single seat, two seat, or you overloading the pilot. Is capitalizing on technology and increase in processing power to make the seamless exchange or make the exchange of information where pilots in the past used to have to push buttons and do something uh, ubiquitous and in the background. And we're getting closer and closer and closer to do that, which actually tends to lessen the manpower requirement. But there are instances over long duration missions where you know, you've got a, val a, a valid point in terms of numbers. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, let me wrap this up with a couple of uh, closing thoughts on these gentlemen. I'm sure will be happy to hang around for those of you who have the time to do so. Uh, but while the importance of the new long-range sensor shooter aircraft in supporting national security grows, I think all of you recognize that our current U.S. bomber fleet continues to age. It now averages over 40 years of age. 
The youngest B-52 is over 50, while they and our over 30-year-old B-1s can continue to offer important contributions, their survivability grows more questionable every day. The nation's 20 B-2s, we talked about that a little bit, uh, now over 20 years old, are going to provide important capabilities in the future, but the small fleet limits their potential. So we need a new long-range sensor shooter as quickly as possible. The new B-21 is going to be a central element of future combat. Its critical attributes of long range, large payload, high survivability, and versatility to adapt to new developments makes it uniquely suited to dealing with the challenges posed by a future that's very much more challenging than Iran or Afghanistan. So once again, thank you all very much for being here today, and please join me in thanking our panel members.